so we have about uh, an hour here where we're going to try and go through um, module two of the workshop. Um, and again, these are just the usual Creative Commons license points. So the focus today is on targeted quantitative metabolomics. Uh, I gave you a bit of an introduction to untargeted. Uh, that was sort of just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, but what we're focused on both the lab and the lecture today is how to do targeted quantitative metabolomics. So again, just to say or note our time, we've just finished our break here. So in Montreal, it was lunch. Here it was coffee. Uh, after this module, it'll be lunch in Edmonton and um, coffee um, break in Montreal. Um, so I want to emphasize a couple of things. We're going to try and focus on understanding the differences between targeted and untargeted metabolomics. We're also going to focus on why it's important to quantify things in metabolomics. And then we're going to look at the three major platforms in metabolomics. And we're going to show you how NMR, quantitative metabolomics, is done, or targeted metabolomics, how targeted GC metabolomics is done, and how targeted or quantitative LC metabolomics is done. So you guys saw the slide earlier, um, and there's these two bipartite paths. There's a targeted approach to, to metabolomics and an untargeted approach. A targeted is a quantitative approach. Untargeted is non-quantitative. Approach and targeted methods, you can use often there'll be 96 well plate format systems. Um, and a targeted can be done with triple quad MS, QTRAP MS, it can be done with NMR, it can also be done with GCMS. Uh, there are kits available for these approaches. Uh, it can also be done internally in labs. It's done by many groups. Untargeted metabolomics has to be typically done with um, mass spec, LCMS, usually high resolution mass spec. Um, the process, as I said, is to collect lots of spectra, do lots of alignment, clustering, peak detection, and then to do things like feature selection and minimizing or reducing the number of signals so that then you can do some metabolite annotation or identification. Um, so the focus in untargeted is, is to do the stats first and then identification later. Um, or shoot first, ask questions later, and the targeted approach is ask questions um, and then um, use the quantitative data to, to identify biomarkers and make biological interpretation. Um, so I'm not sure if I can get to some of this. So with targeted versus untargeted, um, the targeted side, as I said, it's defined coverage. It's a pre-selected set. Targeted can do as little as 10 metabolites at a time to as many as, as up to 1,400 now. Uh, targeted is, is generalizable to all the major platforms. You guys are going to see this today. Um, it specifically was developed for hypothesis testing, but a lot of people are now using targeted metabolomics for discovery. They're discovering biomarkers. They're discovering biology. Um, and this is because if you quantify things, you'll find out that most biomarkers are based on quantitative values and whether you're above or below a threshold. So if you have a threshold, you have a biomarker. Um, and so target metabolomics focuses on absolute quantification. That means you're getting millimolar, micromolar, nanomolar values. Uh, it's a very fast approach. You'll see how quick it can be. It's good for automation. Um, it's good for kit systems. As I said before, it's something that can be very standardized. Um, and uh, increasingly is, is standardizable. You can follow ISO guidelines. You can put it into um, uh, general practice for clinical work. The untargeted, as we said before, it's open-ended. Uh, you're measuring tens of thousands of features. It's really specific to high resolution mass spec. You can kind of do it for uh, um, NMR, but that's not really done anymore. Um, it is ideal in principle for compound discovery. It's good for exploration. Uh, it's good for hypothesis generation. Uh, you can do what's called relative quantification. Where this is higher than that, um, but you don't get concentrations. And of course, the relative values vary from lab to lab or day to day. As a rule, it's not very fast. It's not very automated. It's not very standardized. So this has been a problem with it. 
of course it's you know it's fun with that if everything is is non-standard it makes it more interesting for students and scientists because they get to invent their own processes but it doesn't really get you very far in terms of translation so the uh, myths about um, untargeted metabolomics are many um, and widespread. So some of the myths that people talk about in terms of quantitative metabolomics are targeted. Most people think it's too expensive. Most think it's too time consuming. Most think it's less, less sensitive. Most think it's uh, lacks comprehension or is not as comprehensive. Uh, many people think it's less likely to lead to significant discoveries because you can't do this hypothesis um, generation. So what typically happens with targeted or quantitative metabolomics is relegated to a minor role of confirmation. Well, typically untargeted metabolomics has been getting this starring role of discovery. And that's kind of reflected in the way that the number of papers that have appeared. So in the early days of metabolomics, um, targeted metabolomics was the most common approach. 76% of all papers um, 10 or 12 years ago were in the area of targeted. Um, untargeted was rare, it was 24%. And then if we classify things in terms of, yes, you can do target metabolomics, but were you also doing quantitative metabolomics? And that was even smaller. So yes, you can do target metabolomics, but you can also do it in a way that it's not quantitative. That is, you aren't using reference standards, you aren't using calibration standards, you aren't using C13 isotopes or other things. Now in 2022, uh, which is the last year we looked at things, uh, untargeted has moved ahead. Um, almost two thirds of papers are uh, untargeted, one third are targeted, and the percentage of quantitative metabolomics papers has continued to drop. Now this is a very disturbing trend uh, for me and perhaps for many other people. Because the only way you can get it to move into the industry, the only way you can get it to move to pharma, the only way you can reproduce it is to have something that's quantitative. I mean, that's the essence of science. Um, so at some level, I agree that metabolomics is moving towards extinction. Uh, because if, if we're only doing untargeted stuff, then it's, um, it's a free-for-all. And, and nothing will be reproducible. Nothing will be used in, in the world of industry. So why have we been shifting to untargeted? Well, again, people think that if I do untarget, I'm going to discover a new compound, a new biomarker. I can speak from experience of almost 20 years of looking in this. An average of one to two compounds are identified each year. So only one to two compounds are identified for every 10,000 published metabolomic studies. So if all of you published you know, two papers a year, every year, over your lifetime, you will never report the discovery of a new metabolite. It's just the odds are against you. Um, so you're not going to discover new metabolites by untargeted metabolomics. There's a general belief that you can get more compounds identified by untargeted methods than targeted. So right now, the current targeted methods average about 500 plus compounds. Some methods can get up to 1,400. When I've done literature reviews on untargeted, the average number of compounds identified by untargeted methods is less than 100. So the fact is, targeted methods identify many more molecules than untargeted. They have a much larger set that they're working with, therefore probably better opportunity for discovery. There's also the assumption that, that untargeted is faster and easier than targeted methods. The fact is that untargeted methods, because there's so much data analysis, data processing, follow up, all those peaks that have to be emerged, all those peaks that have to be characterized, all the batch control approaches you have to implement, all the challenges with um, data processing and reprocessing and reprocessing again, um, they are generally five to 50 times slower than targeted methods. People usually say that untargeted is cheaper. Um, so typically targeted assays can be run for as little as $20 a sample. Typically, if you go to a lab or a core facility, the untargeted methods often cost more than 200, often $300 per sample because of the high data processing and informatics costs. Um, in the world of untargeted, there's certainly more opportunity for software development and software innovation. That's good on one level, but if, it's, if none of it's standardized, it means that you're writing software to an audience of two. Um, 
because everyone's got a different method, a different approach, a different style. So yes, uh, you can publish a lot of software and that's what a lot of people do. But as I say, these things aren't getting used or cited because it's just for your lab and your friends. You're more likely to find novel patentable biomarkers rely on targeted methods. Well, the fact is you can't patent natural compounds and most biomarkers that are found and assessed uh, are ones where you're using concentration thresholds. It's not about the marker itself, it's about the concentration. If you don't measure concentrations, you can't get FDA approval. So the FDA, Health Canada, everywhere else requires precise quantitative measures. So if you don't quantify, can't get anything translated to the clinic, to the industry, to pharma, to anywhere else. So in terms of targeted metabolomics, yes, we've got a question. Um, a question from uh, Montreal. I've noticed many targeted kits and extraction methods are for specific tissues and fluids in model organisms. How much of the increase in untargeted publications is coming from plant or non-model animal species that don't have any kit options? Many of the students here are researching these types of environmental systems. So it's true, a lot of the targeted methods are sort of specific for biofluids or in some cases tissues and the, the quantitation normalization has been um, done for common or uh, frequently used samples. But yeah, there are targeted kits or systems that have been published for um, tissues. There's ones that have been published for plants. Uh, there's others that are being established for the microbiome. So it's starting to appear. Um, but yeah, if, if your system is not part of the favored targeted set, then um, you have to develop your own targeted assay um, or you're, you have to do the untargeted methods. So in NMR-based metabolomics, the number of compounds you can identify is between about 50 to 200, GCMS between 20 and 120, something called direct injection or direct infusion mass spec, um, 150 to 400 compounds, LCMS-based methods, 300 to 800, lipidomics, up to maybe 3,000 compounds that can be identified and semi-quantified. The, the range can be in micromolar to nanomolar. So NMR is the least sensitive, MS is the most sensitive, where you can get down to nanomolar sensitivity. And one of the things we have to remember when we're doing metabolomics is we're essentially doing analytical chemistry. Um, Analytical chemistry has been around for 100 years. It is a branch of chemistry that deals with the quantitative determination of the chemical components of substances and mixtures. That's a definition of analytical chemistry. So there's a, a word there underlined or marked in red, and that's quantitative. So I think uh, what's happened in both metabolomics and also proteomics is that we've, we've forgotten the definition of analytical chemistry. We've forgotten the importance of quantification. We've been affected by what I call proteomics influencers and proteomics refugees, because a lot of people who do metabolomics have originally come from the proteomics world. Um, MS-based proteomics workflows, MS-based proteomics concepts have been widely adopted in the MS community. Um, some of that's good, but it's also been problematic because a number of papers in the field of proteomics is steadily declining because they didn't bother quantifying. And so people have never been able to identify uh, any useful protein biomarkers for more than two decades. And there's the general belief that, that medically useful biomarkers are qualitative measures. Um, and that's, that's, that's wrong. Um, every biomarker that's used, except for histology imaging markers, um, is, is a quantifiable entity. We have concentration values for glucose and creatinine and for everything else that's used by doctors. Uh, or anyone else in the world of toxicology or environmental testing. So the issue of quantification and metabolomics is, is, is not new. This is a feature article in Trends in Biotechnology with the title, there's a specter haunting metabolomics, the specter of quantification. Uh, specter is a word for ghost. Uh, this was written by uh, these two scientists and they basically came to the conclusion that the field has to become more quantitative if any of the findings are going to be translated to practical applications in human health, in biomedicine, but also in environment and agriculture uh, and any other field. So when you quantify, um, and this is what analytical chemists have known for many years, is it's, it's reproducible. It means you've got um, you know, a value. Uh, it's quoted in nanomolar, micromolar, millimolar. Therefore, it's verifiable. 
concept of nanomolar, millimolar, micromolar is universal. Anyone, no matter which country you're from, which discipline you're in, you know what that means. The units don't change over time. It means you can do direct comparisons to standard reference values. And so there are lots of reference values. And so you've been in um, clinical chemistry, know there are textbooks of these values. And the HMDB has thousands of these reference values. Um, so this means that if you can use reference values, you don't always have to have hundreds of healthy control samples in every study. That's the normal design in untargeted metabolomics. You have to have dozens to hundreds of healthy controls because you don't have anything to reference to. But if you do, do quantitative values, then yeah, just look it up in the standard reference tables. These are universal. They are published for different age groups, population groups, ethnic groups. Um, they all have reference values. If we look at what's been important, the most important metabolomics discoveries over the last 15 years, most of these have involved measuring concentration differences of well-known metabolites. So trimethylamine oxide has been identified as critical in the development of cardiovascular disease. TMA is well-known. Threshold values were identified and made these high impact papers published in Nature and Science. Branched chain amino acids and aromatic amino acids were identified in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s as being critical in diabetes. These are well-known metabolites, but their concentration differences between normal, healthy, and diabetic ones is, is the fundamental difference. The discovery of host gut microbiota and metabolism interactions, the discovery of uremic toxins, all was with changes to their concentrations. These were known compounds but their concentrations were the things that made them important. The discovery of oncometabolites. Again, these compounds were known, fumarate, succinate, lactate, 2-hydroxyglutarate, but they change. They change in their concentration, and that's what makes them oncometabolites. The role of metabolites as immune signaling molecules. Again, all well-known molecules. Again, it's the change in concentration that was the discovery that hit this hit impact. And it goes on and on well-known molecules, and it's the change in their concentration, their absolute concentration, that determines whether this is a, a discovery or something that's minor. It's not a new compound that's being discovered. It's their change in concentration that led to these papers, which have been cited thousands and thousands of times. So if quantitation is important, how do you make it simple? So you can, do quantitative metabolomics yourself. Um, there are protocols that are published. And if you read the method carefully and you know a little bit about chemistry, you can do it yourself. You obviously need an instrument. You need to spend some money to get some isotopic standards or labeling reagents. Uh, you can do this for LCMS. Or in some cases, you don't even need labeled agents because you can do this by NMR or GCMS. You do have to make reference calibration curves. It's dull, but it's important. Um, and you can sometimes either use existing software or develop in-house software, or many vendors supply the software. So you can do it. Um, many dozens of labs create quantitative metabolomic assays. You can also spend some money. You can buy uh, things called the NMR food scanner from Brooker, or the NMR BI Lisa or BI Quant from Brooker. These are instruments with the software just install, press go, and you're off to the races. You can get, or used to be able to get Cyx, something called the lipidizer. You can get a seahorse. Um, you can also get a commercial clinical analyzer. These are instruments that measure quantitatively many metabolites. Um, they're expensive. You know, the seahorse is cheaper, but these are things that you can do. You can also send to academic labs, uh, core facilities that do metabolomic services. So there's a company in Austria called Biocrates that can do certified labs. TMIC has a number of labs that do quantitative, absolute quantitative metabolomics. There are institutes in the US, the Broad Institute um, at MIT, the University of Washington, Seattle, Beaumont, Michigan, Chapel Hill, Duke, the West Coast Metabolomics Center. All of these centers offer some quantitative metabolomics assays that you can buy at sort of a at cost level. You can also send samples to commercial labs. A lot of groups, especially large uh, epidemiological groups, will send their stuff to Metabolon, and that has almost 20 different quantitative assays. Biocrates is a company 
Konomics is a company here in Edmonton. Nightingale, a Finnish a company. Um, Metware, another one. These are commercial facilities that also will do quantitative metabolomics. Or if you've got the instrumentation yourselves, you can buy and run kits, uh, just like if you've done molecular biology. And these can be kits or they can be methods. You can get kits from Biocrates. You can get from kits here in Metabolomics, uh, which is a company based in Edmonton. You can get eye methods from Sinex, uh, a lipidomics product calls. You can get software and tools from Konomics, uh, various MS vendors and white papers. So whether it's the kits or methods, you can do this yourself as well. So I'll talk about some of the kits that we have developed in TMIC. Um, and um, this is the basis to what you guys will be doing in the lab. Um, the reason why we're pushing it is because this is our made in Canada approach. Uh, it's being done by TMIC. TMIC is one of the sponsors of this um, workshop. Uh, but it also opens the door for people to do quantitative metabolomics, and we'll show you how easy it is. So there's an LCMS kit system. Uh, the one that's been developed um, can range from measuring metabolites from 140 compounds up to 650 compounds. Um, it's being adjusted to measure up to 12 to 1300 compounds. Um, just like molecular biology kits, they're relatively easy to use. Everything you need comes in the box. There are training videos. It's been moved to several labs. It's relatively cheap, um, anywhere from 45 to $90 per sample, depending on the, the type of assay. And you can run lots and lots of samples in a 96 well format. We're also GCMS kits. This is also a quantitative approach. Um, it can measure up to 100 chemical standards. It has, it's bundled with those standards. It's bundled with the derivatization reagents. It has the software. Uh, it affects, uh, accepts a variety of soft uh, files. It's very fast, as you guys will see, um, and you can get very, very high accuracy identification. Um, it can run on several different sample types. You will be working one that's just specific to urine, and it certainly requires some, some, some sample preparation and derivatization, which is what you have to do with GCMS. We've also, and we'll explore NMR kits. Um, and the idea again is to help standardize things and is to make other labs standardize how they do NMR. Uh, we've introduced a number of new software tools for this. It makes it very fast. It allows you to interactively work with the, the spectra. The kits themselves have all the reagents, the standards, the software, and you can analyze up to 60 or more compounds in different samples. This is much cheaper than the GC and LC that runs. So I get about, it's about $10 per sample. So I'm going to talk about each of these methods. I'm going to talk about NMR first, then I'm going to do GCMS, then I'm going to talk about LCMS. And this is just to give you an overview. And then after lunch, we'll do the lab, and you'll actually work with some real samples to work with the software. We're not going to put you into the lab, because otherwise we have to have everyone uh, approved for lab, and we don't have as many instruments. But we're going to give you data that was collected on instruments using these kits, um, and then you're going to process them. So the NMR kit, um, in terms of an overview, um, typically what you have is you've got your sample, maybe it's a urine or blood or serum sample. If it's serum, we're gonna do an ultrafiltration where we move the proteins. We're gonna add um, a couple of compounds that are in the kit. Uh, one that's used a phase reference, another is a chemical shift reference. We put them into an NMR tube. We collect the NMR spectrum. We process the NMR spectrum, and that's the software we'll use. We'll analyze it using a software called Magmit, and it'll produce a list of metabolites and their concentrations. So the focus that you're going to have is these last three steps. The first part is stuff that someone else has done for you. So typically, when we do NMR, um, we usually take get a spectrum. We get uh, what's called this free induction decay, or FID. That's that noisy bell ringing spectrum that I talked about before. So we use Fourier transform to convert that so that we can see the peaks that make sense to us. These are, but often when you do the Fourier transform, things are sometimes upside down or they're what we call dephased. And so you have to do a manual thing called phase correction where you change the, the spectral parameters or the display parameters so the peaks are pointing up, things are correctly phased. You have to make sure that the baseline is flat. You have to get rid of the water peak, which is the big thing on the left. 
Um, and then you have to have reference it so they get a zero point um, chemical shift reference. So that's something that NMR people kind of like to do, but it takes about 10 minutes per spectrum. So if you've got you know 100 spectra, that's a lot of time. And it's just sort of menial, tedious stuff. Um, once you've done that manually, um, then you do the thing called spectral deconvolution. And this is illustrated with this figure here. So let's pretend we have a mixture. In this case, the mixture has three compounds, compound A, B, and C. In NMR, things add based on their concentration so, and their peak intensities. So if you visually look at A, B, and C and just sort of see where the peaks line up, you can see how the sum of A, B, and C equals the mixture. Well, deconvolution is the reverse of that. It's an inverse problem. It's taking the mixture and saying, what are the components there? Um, so in this case, it does this sort of spectral matching. It has to match these peaks from a known set of other peaks from pure pot compounds from a database. And then it's got to sort of adjust and match, adjust and match to see if those peaks will all fit and whether you can come up to the solution that says, yes, this, this top spectrum is the sum of these three compounds, not the sum of four different compounds or 12 different compounds. And it's based on the intensity and the positions. So that's spectral deconvolution. Now spectral deconvolution can be done manually. Um, it can be done semi-automatically, or you can do it um, fully automatically. So the manual approaches are done by a software tool called Konomics, which is a company based in Edmonton here. And people process the spectra by hand, they have a large library and they do this guess and check to deconvolute, which is like I showed here. Here's the spectrum at the top. Guess which ones it might be. Could be compound Z, compound X. You try, does it fit? No. Try compound Q, try, no. Compound A, sort of. Okay, what about compound C? Yes, maybe. And it's back and forth. So it's a guess and check process. Um, and you're dragging and dropping and adjusting the spectra to match the peaks. Now, if you can automate the process where you're, it's not only deconvolution, but also automating the idea of phasing and peak correction and baseline correction, then you can make it a lot faster, potentially 10 to 25 times faster. You can also improve the precision and recall. It means that you can let the thing run overnight instead of spending hours staring at a, at a computer. It also means it's consistent and reproducible because it's not prone to user bias um, or errors that humans make. And it often can detect signals that humans don't easily detect or individuals differ in. So this led us to develop a software tool that automates spectral deconvolution and it's called MagNet, not MagNet. So that's magnetic resonance from metabolomics. So, we originally had a program called Basil, but Magnet is new, uh, faster, uh, gives us greater flexibility. So it uses a combination of machine learning, rules, expert rules to do the pattern fitting and deconvolution. It has automatic phasing. It has automatic chemical shift reference. It has automatic water removal, baseline correction. And it has automatic peak de deconvolution, means that it identifies and quantifies everything. So on average, it can identify about 55 to 60 serum metabolites in about 10 minutes. That's completely without any human intervention. So it means you can run it in parallel or overnight, and you can do hundreds and hundreds. Uh, it's being adopted and has been adopted to things like wine and beer and juice and other fermentation products. So this is sort of what it looks like in concept. So you're doing peak integration. This is the sort of spectra you can see with a mixture and where you're seeing elements that are covered or overlapping indicates where the fitting has been performed. In the lower half, you're seeing this iterative fitting where it's seeing some peaks and it says, oh, if I move shift or left or right, it fits. If I scale up and down, it fits. So we're seeing the outline of the spectrum and then you're seeing where the fitting has been done so it's overlapped. So the color uh, and the color indication tells you how confident you are in terms of metabolites. The integrated area tells you the concentration. So in the case of serum, which is what you guys will try, it can do it in five to 10 minutes, identifies about 57 metabolites. And the variation in terms of concentrations is, is often well less than 10%, sometimes as good as 5%. You can do it in fecal water. Uh, you can do it 
in CSF, we've done it in wine and beer. Um, again, it's, it's fully automatic and it is doing the spectral deconvolution, the area calculation, the concentration calculations. So in terms of operation, typically it'll take that spectrum, it'll do the Fourier transform in about five seconds. It'll do some of the phasing in about 15 seconds. It'll then continue to do further pre-processing in about another 30 seconds, cleaning up your spectrum. The rest of the time is spent fitting those peaks against the library of compounds uh, in its spectral library. Once it's done that, then it produces a, a fitted spectrum. And so this is the full spectrum, the NMR spectrum at the bottom. And the top is um, a, an expanded view. So you can zoom in and you can see how the fitting has performed and how close or how good the match is. Most of the time you don't have to do any other adjustments. Sometimes it goes off in a wild goose chase and it does need a bit of intervention. So the idea is to have the software and the visualization tools to allow you to make those adjustments in case it just went off on a wild goose chase. Once it's finished its deconvolution, um, it gives you the list. So the list is the compound names, there's the HMDB identifiers, and the concentration, and then also a confidence score. You know, not every metabolite is perfectly identified. Some just have a single peak. Uh, others have 30 peaks. If you have a metabolite with 30 peaks and all of them match, then you can be 100% confident that's, that's there. If it's a single peak, um, you know, it could be something like acetate or formate, but if it's in a non-unique area, then you're not so sure. So there's a confidence score that's often associated with certain metabolites. Yes. So just to follow on with your uh, I wanted to uh, last week was that uh, mentioned that spike quarantine and uh, deglucose. So does it mean that uh, an MMR can uh, differentiate between no, NMR can't generally distinguish between stereoisomers. Um, but we know that these compounds are the ones that are found in the human body. Um, so there is the D-carnitine in, in mammals, and D-glucose seems to be the preferred um, version that's found in, in mammalian systems. So there's an assumption uh, of what these things could be or should be. So I'm going to switch to GCMS metabolomics. Again, I'm just doing a kind of an overview um, because we're sort of short on time here. Um, so as I said, there are these kits uh, that are available. Um, I've highlighted some of them about what they are. The one that we'll be using is specifically optimized for, for urine. The sample data we'll be using in the lab is for urine. Um, and yes, you know, running the kit takes uh, a few hours, but then once you've got the data, then the analysis in principle should take only a minute or two. So the kit assay um, for this is uh, a little different. So if we're taking a urine sample, uh, we're gonna add compounds like methoxyamine and TMSFA. This is a way that does the, the um, silation. We'll incubate for an hour, and then we'll transfer the mixture to a, an auto sampler tube. Uh, once you've got into the sample tube, then you can put it into the GCMS instrument. It will run things through the, the GC chromatogram. It'll get your spectra. Um, the sample set will also include some baseline values because that's what you have to run in, in um, GCMS and some calibration points also typically run in a GCMS run. And then from your data that comes from there, you'll run it through this software called GC AutoFit. And just like the Magmet NMR, it'll produce a list of metabolites and their concentrations. So the concept in GCMS is sort of here. So if you've got your GC chromatogram, choose a peak. Sometimes the peak is a pure compound. Sometimes it's two or three compounds. Um, so you'll do a sort of spectral deconvolution thing. You'll look at the fragment ion spectra. These are the EIMS spectra. And so this particular peak had three compounds that were eluding almost at the same time. They had three different EIMS spectra. And then we're going to compare that, those spectra against our database. In the case, the, the GC AutoFit has its own database. It's going to match these things. It's going to identify the specific compounds based on those spectral matches. And you can see just by visually comparing the different spectra, how they match. And once you've got a good match, then you've got your compound and you can integrate and figure out the concentration. So 
again, we talked about this earlier that when we do EIMS spectra, we have multiple peaks. Um, so those peaks, either you can you know, collect them on pure compounds, you can also predict them, um, but that gives you the structural uniqueness. Each spectrum here is unique. Each of them corresponds to a compound and to specific structure. So the question was, do these software tools require certain spectral types or data files? Yes, there's certain data file types that are allowed, and those are mentioned in the software, and we'll get into that actually in the lab about what, what file formats they accept. So again, you know, GCMS, you're typically working with EIMS, you're also working with derivatization, uh, TMS derivatization, TDBMS, methoxyamine derivatization, these things change the chemical structure, they're also going to change the mass. So if you know, you're looking for a metabolite, but it's a different, if it's derivatized, it's going to be a different mass than what's going to be in, say, HMDB. So you need to know that to make sure you're identifying the right compound. So in terms of GCMS, most people apply it to things like amino acids, organic acids, sugars, fatty acids, and lower molecular weight compounds. I mentioned that gas chromatography has very high resolution. It's more reproducible than LCE. So this is why it's generally more popular. It's also a lot cheaper than LCMS. EMS also has very standardized um, ionization. It's always exactly the same energy, 70 electron volts. Whereas, whereas with ESI, uh, it's all over the place. So that means that the comparison between EI spectra and the library is really good. Whereas when you go to LCMS spectra, they're all pretty different, even if it's the same compound. Different fragment ions, different intensities, it's actually quite confusing. So EIMS and GCMS, highly reproducible, very standardized, which is great for translation uh, and applications. Anyways, as I said, the spectra are compared to a database and scored by their similarity. Similarity is done through a scoring called the match factor. Um, and it, it's sort of, it's a, it's a dot product, basically. If you remember A dot B, uh, A, B cos theta, that's a dot product, or it's two vectors, A, um, A1, B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3, that's a dot product as well. You normalize it, they multiply it by a thousand, they you know, do it with the intensity normalization. So this is the formula, but it basically says how many peaks match with the observed and expected, how well do they match? If you've got a perfect match, the match factor is a thousand. A dot B equals one times a thousand equals a thousand. If A dot B don't match too well, then it's 0 0.3, 0 0.5 times a thousand, or in other words, between 300 and 500. Here's an example of a match factor where the match factor is 823 or 0.823. And you can see, you know, almost all the peaks match, but intensities don't. You can see this, and we're looking at 2,5-dichlorophenol and 3,4-dichlorophenol. So they have exactly the same mass, they're just isomers. Um, but the MSMS spectra match almost perfectly. And most people would say it's the same compound. They probably would have a different retention index, and that would be the way you distinguish it. But this is typically a, a threshold of 800, above 750. It's usually considered to be a match. Um, in this case, you'd be wrong, but it's darn close. So how do you do GCMS? Well, first of all, you need to have some standards. Uh, you use alkanes, um, going maybe from octane to hexadecane. And these are both your calibration standards for your retention index, but they can also be used to help with um, some quantification. You have to run a blank sample, which contains your solvent and derivatization reagents, like the TMSF, A, or methyloxine. Those are there because they show up when you run your GCMS and you don't want to chase useless peaks. Uh, then you run your sample of interest. So there's sort of three runs that you do. And uh, then from there, you create your calibration file, which is your retention index, to, to set your retention index values for all your other metabolites in your sample of interest. 
So this is what your alkane standard might look like. If there's these eight or nine standards, they separate in this case over about 10 minutes, uh, ranging from octane to hexadecane. Uh, from that set of standards, you can calculate the retention index. So retention index uh, is basically you look at the peaks beside your unknown. So in this case, two is the unknown, one and three are the known ones. One is hexane, one is heptane. That's done through your calibration. So we knew that hexane came off at, at six and a half minutes and heptane came off at 11 and a half minutes. We do a two minute correction because of a solvent blank or delay. But then you calculate the index using this equation, 100 uh, times n plus n minus n, log unknown, log. And so you can see the numbers. Uh, in this case, uh, hexane has six, heptane has seven. Um, so it's uh, seven minus six plus, um, I think, was it six, whatever. So it should come up with either 100 times six plus 100 times the log values. So the retention index for compound number two is 644. So even though the retention time was 6.25 minutes, the retention index is 644. And you can do this for all the other compounds using your um, hexane, heptane, octane, so on. So this calculates your retention index, it normalizes everything so that you are consistent. That's, that's a real strength of GCMS. So then you can analyze your sample data once you've got these retention indices calibrated. Um, yes, Amina? What's the calculation of the retention index? So is it the same when we apply a tensor share program? The columns are, is it just the same for all of our Um There is, there's an isothermal retention index, and then there's some of the modified ones. But the in essence, if you've separated your alkane standards using the same temperature profile, then you should be able to calculate a retention index that is the same, because you're always referencing it to your alkane standards, and you're using the same formula. So in principle, those retention indices should be the same, but they're normally called isothermal, uh, meaning it's the same temperature. But I think when you look at the literature, even if you have a temperature program where you're speaking up, they still match almost perfectly to the isothermal ones. Yeah. So you take your um, alkane standards, you get your retention indices, you get rid of, use your blanks to get rid of the false positives, that cleans up your extra peaks. And now you can start doing you know, the match factor and the integrated area under the peaks to determine which ones and your retention times or retention indices to identify your compounds. So that process of matching, identifying, quantifying is done by the software called GC AutoFit. So it needs three spectra sets. It needs your sample, you know, your urine sample in this case. It needs a blank, which has your, you know, your solvent and your derivatization mixtures. And it needs the alkane standards. Uh, you also will have done, and this is sort of the, the dirty secret, you've done a calibration run on certain compounds. And that calibration run was already done for you um, so that you can do the quantitation. Um, but once you've done that calibration run, you can quantify for months. Um, so with those spectra, uh, which you guys will get, uh, you can, it, this will do the alignment. Uh, it'll do the, you know, peak uh, retention index calculation. Uh, it'll match those retention indices to its known reference set of retention indices. It'll do the peak identification, it'll do the peak integration, and then the peak concentration using the calibrations which were run months ago. It can accept different files. So there's NetCDF and MZXML files. It's fast, it's about a minute per spectrum. And you can identify up to 100 compounds and these have pretty high accuracy. So it's the one you're running is optimized for urine, but it can be adapted to other biofluids. And as I said before, you still need to do, you know, if you're running these things, you still have to do the derivatization, you still have to do the sample run. So it's it's not, you know, press a button, close your eyes. Um, there's a bit of work 
as there is with any molecular biology or chemistry kit. Um, there are different input files, the alkane standard, the blank sample, the sample files. These are all required. You have to upload them. Uh, some may require file conversion. It's explained in the web server. You guys, I don't think, have to do that. Everything is bundled for you. Uh, but depending on the instruments, there is this support. If you need to convert, there's a really good program called Proteo Wizard, which allows you to convert almost any file in GCMS, LCMS to some kind of standardized MS file. So be aware of Proteo Wizard. This is something that many, many people have to use all the time. So this just shows you how you would upload the GCMS files. Uh, you can upload your spectra file. You can have them as individual, the alkane standards, the blanker samples, or they can all be zipped together. And the program will figure out which one is the alkane, which one's the blank, and which one's the sample. Uh, there are also examples you can run, so you get acquainted with it. Um, for the lab, you guys won't be running examples. You'll be actually running real samples that were collected for this course. Um, if you're you know, running these things, you should check your alkane standards. So there's tools to visualize online. So you can see your spectra. You can see, in this case, it looks like there's about um, a dozen peaks that were run in the reference alkane set. Um, you can look at your sample spectrum. You can see there's quite a few peaks. If this is a urine sample, there's literally hundreds of peaks. And you can zoom in and scroll out just like you can with the NMR spectra. As it's running, it's going to produce a list. And here's the same thing. Here's your HMDB identify. Here is your compound name. Here's the calculated retention index and retention time, the intensity, the match factor, um, and then the concentration. So all of that's printed out for you. Um, all of the peaks, in this case, are identified and quantified uh, in the spectrum, which is also interactively viewable. You can then send all of that to a CSV or Excel file format, um, and you can download those results. And as I said, you can also view the spectra interactively, just like with the NMR one. So again, there's a difference between running the kit, which means you're in the instrument, you've got gloves, and you're pipetting, and you're running things for an hour or two, um, versus this, which is that's been collected for you. How do you interpret it? Um, you know, running GC or LC or NMR is something that people have been doing for decades. This stuff is new. This isn't very widely done, uh, and the automation is relatively recent, and that's what's made metabolomics so interesting. So we've done NMR, and we've done GCMS, and Nia has a question. Oh, I've got five minutes left. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about LCMS metabolomics. We're going to talk about targeted metabolomics by LC triple quad. So this is a tandem mass spectrometer, um, and we use QQQ, meaning quadrupole collision cell quadrupole, um, but it's still called uh, tandem mass spec. Things get ionized, things get dissociated, things are detected. We've seen this slide before, and the focus that we do for this particular lab in this example is multiple reaction monitoring. It means choosing a specific analyte. This is the one that's shown here, red, triangle, blue. Uh, that's a compound, and so we've chosen a specific precursor. We know its mass and its retention time. And then we look at its uh, product ion, and it's a specific product ion. It's only the red product ion that we're looking at. So it's a precursor product ion pair that we look at. So that's sufficient, both the mass and retention time for those two is sufficient to fully identify that molecule, uh, even if our mass resolution is only one Dalton. Um, and so it simplifies our spectra. We're not seeing thousands of peaks anymore. It's just you know pairs. And we can integrate the peak areas because we have some reference calibration ones that were there or some isotopic standards. And so we can actually get the concentration. So here's a you know, total ion chromatogram that we can get from a single quad, pretty messy. If we've done the Q triple quad MRM, if we've just chosen a 286-157 pair that it loots at 9.89 minutes, it's all simplified to this, that one peak, basically. So instead of a massive peak stacked on the top of each other, it's just this one. And that one peak is one that we can integrate 
easily. And that's one that allows us to, to kind of A, identify, B, quantify. So we have, we have to have a list of precursor and product ion pairs. We need their, their collision energies, declustering potentials, and retention times. That's the input information. That's determined for all the target molecules. So if your kit has 140 as its standard method, you have to do that for 140 metabolites. If the kit has 640, you have to do that for 640 types in principle. Um, this is used as the synth software. And so this is the table that would go into the software. And that's what the software you guys will use has. Typically it's run on 96 volt plates. So a lot of the software that's used by vendors or companies will have ways of registering the, so the samples, matching which ones are, which ones are the calibrants, which ones are blanks, which ones are standards. Um, typically you have to add um, isotopic standards you have to generate calibration curves. Uh, you have to do integration to make sure that peaks are like there's seven points. They follow a clear line as you go up the concentration. So those are things that are put in usually in the kits uh, as part of the MRM list, as part of the calibration process. Um, once you've got those MRM transitions, they're identified mm -hmm. from your actual samples. Qualifiers are identified. Peaks are picked. Peaks are integrated concentrations are determined. Um, and then those integrated areas and concentrations that all the metabolites are generated to produce a list, just like it did for GCMS, just like it did for NMR. So all of them produce lists of metabolites and concentrations. So the LCMS kit that was run for your samples uh, is one of these that uses uh, about 140, so it's a smaller kit. Um, relatively fast 96 well format. So the actual process that was used in the kit, um, we have samples that are split into a, a derivatization for amines, another one that's derivatized for organic acids. They're separated, run on these triple quad instruments. Um, you can see the derivatization reagents that were used. This helps in quantification. It also helps in enhancing the signal intensity. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. Um, we've got a mix of liquid chromatography mass spec as well as flow injection. We use anywhere between 20 and 50 microliters. It takes about 30 minutes of, per sample. So 96 samples means it takes about two, uh, a little over two days automatically on an instrument, just runs, measures many different types of molecules, and it has the software. Typically, we want to have the software process each sample very quickly. We used chemical tagging to give single column separation. And as I said, the different panels, one for amines, one for organic acids. Another one is flow injection for lipids. We have isotopic standards. And these have to be following very strict requirements for ISO. So you have to have interday, high interday accuracy, high um, uh, inter and intraday, uh, lower limits of detection, CVs typically less than 15%. Chemical tagging is used a lot now in quantitative metabolomics because it offers a cheap way of getting isotopically labeled standards. If you had to buy or synthesize isotopic standards for every single compound, these kits would cost millions. But by using chemical tagging, you're able to do this much cheaper but includes improves stability, improves reverse phase separation, improves ionization, improves sensitivity, and it reduces costs. Plates that are run, you have to follow a specific design. There's lots of calibration. In fact, almost a sixth of the plate is used for calibration. So 96 wells, 14 are used to standardize, calibrate, clean things up. And then the 82 samples are used to measure. So this is, this is the rigor that has to be done to get quantitative reproducible metabolomics. Assays have been developed. Um, Alan has been working on a lot of them. He's developed uh, the TMIC Prime. He's developed the TMIC Mega along with his wife, Tammy. And then he's also working on a new one called the Giga. So the one you guys are going to be working with uh, measures about 145 metabolites. You can get ratios as well. There's a larger one that's now more frequently used by people and in TMIC, it measures about 650 compounds. But because you can measure and quantify 
Absolutely, it means you can calculate sums and ratios. And that's actually really advantageous. You can you know, pool all the triglycerides into one group. You can do all the branched chain amino acids together. You can calculate ratios of phenylalanine to tyrosine. You can't do that with untargeted or unquantified methods. The new assay, which hopefully will be ready in the fall, should measure about 1,400 compounds. And again, this is many, many times more than what you can identify through untargeted methods. The software has been developed. Uh, Vasu, who's here, has helped develop a lot of the software along with Alan in terms of design. You choose the biofluid, you choose the files, you get the retention time list, you drag and drop this in, you'll have a chance to do this. Processing samples um, can be done quite quickly in ideal world. Um, you guys will have a chance to have some processing. So the goal is to do it all in about five or 10 minutes. Right now it takes a couple of hours um, for about 640 compounds per sample. And it's been used in a whole bunch of different sample types, blood, urine, and stool. Uh, the software uh, is available as a web server, just like GC Autofit, just like Magnet. Um, as I say, right now, the current version of the software takes about an hour or two to identify um, metabolites in a sample. Uh, ideally, that should be shrinking down to a couple minutes. You guys are working with a smaller uh, sample set, so it should take you much, much less time uh, in the lab. We'll try that out shortly. Um, but it also allows you to do uh, interactive calibration, curve editing, interactive peak adjustment, and peak integration. Just like the others, it produces a list of, of um, concentrations in table formats. You can view the spectra to see how things are looking. So to wrap up, I think targeted quantitative metabolomics is actually much easier and much faster than untargeted. It can be done on all the major platforms, and you guys will have a chance to do that. There are different workflows and different types of software. That's certainly expected. Some platforms have some advantages. Other platforms have other advantages. Um, and certainly we're going to try out these things in the web servers in the lab that happens after the break in Montreal or after the lunch here.